Hey, all you happy lost souls. Um, how y'all doing out there? Um, just making a quick video again with some of the artifact stuff. And uh, we are in pretty much this entire collection comes from tributaries linked to the Delaware, um, to the Schuylkill, and to the Susquehanna um, in southeastern Pennsylvania that eventually go out Um to the Delaware, the Penny Pack is a tributary, eventually dumps out into the Delaware and Chamonix goes to the Delaware. The Wissahickon um, kind of does a U from one part of the Schuylkill back into the other, back before the Schuylkill goes down into the river. Um, so, <clears throat> into the Delaware, but a lot of this collection comes from mainly the Penny Pack. And, mainly in the Huntington Valley area for the most part. Um, even though Wissahickon type stuff we find down there, very similar, same group um, in some of the time periods and both creeks were represented. And we have, you know, various um, examples of pottery that go along with maybe some of the groups and maybe some of the early settlers in the area. Um, some of the pottery isn't that, not that old. Some of the glass, um, bring that back mainly to see who uh, the natives at what time period were treating with and who, and you get a lot of French glass, English glass, Dutch glass. Um, and uh, oddly enough, we over here, we have something called chanterelles. Now these are dry from a few years ago. These are little, little dry chanterelles. And chanterelles are a type of, of mushroom. We'll try to back this off a little bit. Try to zoom in a little bit. There you go. So these are dried out chanterelles now. And then, you know, they're about 1 18th of their original, 1 20th of their original size after they shrink down, all the water's out. Um, these are a delicious mushroom. Um, they're called chanterelles or ground flowers. And they have French German origins, but this type of chanterelle, which is only found in certain ancient pathways along the Penny Peck, because that type of mushroom. It actually has a micro riser relationship with certain hardwood roots and complexes of moss. So it, all those three things have to be there and then the weather conditions. But that particular type of chanterelle is European. And I call it the path of, you know, the, the, the golden brick road pretty much. These paths that are lined with these chanterelles that pop out in the end of the summer. Um, can kind of show you where those early fur trappers were because it's my guess that those spores that created those colonies of mushrooms that grow in those exact spots back there were tracked in by European explorers, early ones, in you know, circa late 1500s, early 1600s, talking about the time period of, of the Beaver Wars, um, eventually spawning into the French and Indian War, basically um, a cash grab for beaver pelts and for trade with the natives. You know, the natives of that time period, uh, especially Susquehannocks along um, the Pennypack Creek, which came in and kind of pushed the Lenape tribes out, um, the Delaware tribes out, um, they were after these beaver pelts and, and silver and, and, and things that they could trade in order to get guns. And, and they had stockaded villages, guns, and cannons, this, this group of, of Native Americans. Um, but a lot of the stuff that we're looking at today is, is going to be of the older, older variety. And again, I see tons of critics that, that look at my videos and my collection, and I just see they're just rocks or, um, you know, give me a break, just rocks. Yeah, a lot of these are rocks, but <laughs> most of these are rocks that were influenced or shaped into a tool. And that being the material of the age, most of all the tools that you find from the smallest to the biggest of things are going to be made of stone of some sort. And within that, you get patterns. Um, certain groups use certain materials for certain things. Um, and again, like the people that say they're just rocks, you know, you don't get intelligent pigment or laying enamel down and, and heat treating um, and you, I leave these ones out because you can clearly still see the pigment on them. I have a lot of artifacts that still have some color and pigment left. And you can obviously see the outlining of the red, the black, the red. Um, and, and that's left over from whatever um, 
enamels, whatever dyes, whatever pigments they were using. In the reds, you get this hematite-based um, uh, enamel, um, and you get a lot of stuff with um, um, your mercuries and mercury sulfates and things like that within them. Um, and there's a ton of mercury lead silver back in, the, in that area. And um, one of my favorite things that, that you can really, really see is and you got to have good eyes for this um, artistic eyes. So you see this amorphous blob. Uh, it looks like some conglomerate, um, some quartzites, but you see this red stuff running through it. And you realize that this is a hardened clay, a special kind of clay, a paleogorskite clay which is what the Mayans used to create their famous Mayan blue. When you heat up these, these reds in a kiln, you mix them with some other materials that turn blue eventually. Um, and what you get here is, what is this shape? The top little piece broke off there when I was moving it. But why I was so fascinated with this is because what this is, is somebody's handprint on the inside of it like this. And what you're seeing is a piece of clay that they squeezed, left that imprint, and then dropped on the ground and hardened thousands of years later. And that's what that shape is. That shape is the inside of a clenched fist around a piece of clay. And my hand almost fits on there perfect. And you can see that that's that leftover space from, from squeezing. So you can really see the marks of history left in it. And we get a lot of this high grade soapstone down along the creek and this stuff very easy to flatten and smooth into shapes and you can see here we've got this crazy kelt um, that was shaped down you know we got this ice cream cone looking kelt and we see a very similar style kelt made of a silver a very very rich silver ore right in here we see that shape repeat it we even see a very ice cream cone shaped looking effigy type kelt and you can still see the lacerations and scarring from uh, either sinew or leather or whatever they use to attach this to a staff or it's probably a goose head effigy this one's actually was found in the chamois you get a lot of this high grade um i almost call it basalt mudstone poor man's slate this is the very very high grade um stone almost a shale we find this near the coast. This is part of the actual um, bedrock of the coast. They're basalt type rocks. So you get a lot of these cool artifacts in the Chamonix made of this stuff. And obviously, you know, you even get some pieces that have hull drawn or, drawn or borne through. Uh, now what they probably did uh, to drill this hull is they probably made a little hole first and then got a piece of leather or... Um, sinew through there and kind of just back and forth back and forth you got that hole in there by dragging a piece through maybe with some grit sand using it to break down the other stone and polish that hole out um, we'll find a ton of artifacts with holes in them so I always keep them but you can see that beginning of that process started with a smaller hole and then eventually it would get bigger and you get these little points, um, these tinier points. You can see these super triangular points down in here. There's, those are all little bird points, um, more for dart ends than they are for, for arrow, arrow tips. For birds, mainly smaller prey. Um, you also get these very big, blunt, triangular um, tips for birds. They kind of just, they either would put them on backwards or they were weighted so they'd come up and right back down. They were just trying to knock the bird out, not really trying to damage it, and trying to, to shoot it full of stuff because you know, they're not big, not a lot of meat. Want to damage the, uh, the prey item. Um, so you get a lot of these heavier tips that are, you'll find them in the creeks a lot, um, along with fishing stuff like plumes and little weights and things like that. Um, but it's the time period and you want to, sit there and, and criticize any of the videos or say, oh, they're just rocks or give me a break. You don't know what you're looking at. Well, I do know what I'm looking at and I've been doing this for a very long time. Um, the thing is, there's just a lot to look at. There's, there's patterns of time separated by thousands of years here. So you're looking at really, really old 
you know, you've got these, these are pressure flaking tools to create pressure flaking edges, which um, I probably have a few artifacts that still have retained that in this case down here. Um, yeah, you see this, this white uh, knife end or spear head right here that the tip is broken on. You see that serrated edging where it's pressure, it's pressure flaked and also percussion flaked. So you're getting into a little bit more advanced stone working at that point. Um, so you're looking at like Paleo Indian. Um, the certain Neanderthal artifacts show a lot of percussion, but not pressure. Um, then when you get into the Salutrian era tools, 17,000, 18,000, 19,000 years ago, and you see these quarry sites and these production assembly lines like you see in some of the European sites in France, Spain, some of these ancient Stone Age quarries. Um, that's what you're seeing in, in, in the penny pack in a few of these areas, these entire production sites where stuff's everywhere, preforms, stampings, things undone. Point is, you can't set up a production zone or, or something of that high organization in A, a time of war. You can't really do it if you're constantly being fought or the space is constantly being fought over or an extremely powerful group has taken over everything, enslaved other groups, and you have this huge trading network going back to um, the mound culture and, and the civilization. The thing with American archaeology is we've got this crazy paradigm, um, this 13,000-year-old model, like nothing lived, you know, nothing that resembled a human or a species of human was in the Americas prior to 13,000 years, which is absolute balderdash. We know by the ice core samples just about when things went tits up, and they went tits up like about you know, 13,000 years ago for a few thousand years and this archaeological record kind of everything goes barren for several thousand years after that Clovis period and it kicks back up again but what you're seeing in these quarry sites is you're seeing a much older 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 group that utilized the area for stone um, making a lot of these little uh, little saw type tools a lot of little fishing instruments a lot of little hooks serrated with serrated edges get a really big salutrian style saw over here the serrated edge is, is is still there which is awesome over all this time but you could see the perfect shaping of this if you have this hard quartzite chert type type rock here but this is a perfectly shaped wedge um, perfectly shaped saw in very similar area we find another saw you got a saw on this end here on this side this cutting edge and then you have it shaped here as a handle, but you also have a gouge over here, boring out a hole, making it a little bit bigger. And it's a multifunctional tool. Um, and this is what you're seeing more in that Salutrian time period. Um, it kind of coincides with the people that were making this. This came maybe slightly later that we're using these hard granite amalgamations of different rock and, and ores together. If you got this pad here, this is kind of like a material that would be perfect for sanding. It's like garnet paper almost. Um, but you have all these tools found in pretty much just about six deposits. In the quarry sites, we just get innumerable tools that are used to make other tools essentially. You're looking at a lot of the hammers and the chisels and the augs, and, and some of these are for boring holes in wood. Some of these are woodworking tools. Some of these might be petrified wooden parts off of stuff that turned into stone. Um, but you get these crazy pieces with lots of garnets in them all over the place, these little tiny garnets. It's beautiful. Sapphires, garnets, all that kind of stuff. But you just get banks full of scrapers, all different types of scrapers, different hide scrapers. Um, and uh, these are different agates and quartzes. And um, some have really retained their edges. Some are still razor sharp. You get these razor sharp, like I call these thumb knives. So the curved part has no cutting edge, but the inside straight edge is razor sharp. So you're going to be holding this and cutting. And you can still see that razor sharp cutting edge right right there. Be very careful, that will still cut you. These other tools, these little hammers, um, just, we could speculate their uses on all of them. We have no idea what all of them were used for. 
Um, but I have boxes of, of scrapers like this. Like I don't even keep them all. I have tons of them over here, more of them over here. Um, some of them are really pristine, some of them aren't. And some of the artifacts that you find in a creek have been washed. The edges have been polished by the water, you know, tumbling the pieces over and over again. And some pieces you find, like, they were lost yesterday where they're still razor sharp. And, and you could still see that the transparency in the piece of flint. And uh, you could still see that perfect razor blade scraping, hide scraping. So we got a lot of this hide processing and these different thumb knives. And we even get this, like starting to put some kind of animal worship in, in some of these solution pieces like you get this turtle type shape here in this scraper you can see the artifact patina the shine on that um, and then when you're digging down in these crossing points or these areas that have all these these tools and we find some of the oldest stuff and some of the stuff blew my mind when I looked down and I saw moss and algae covering these two pieces, I took a lot of time cleaning them. But I got them out and I realized, oh wait, there's artifact patina, there's old pitch on there. That this tool is not a composite, this is a composite tool. It, it's got a it's got a wedge right here and a tie down for the shaft and whatever shaft was attached to the end of this hatchet or adds the, the blade kind of curves down like like that so it was probably for maybe for for scooping cutting or scooping out a wooden log to make it hollow um what i think i'm i'm, I'm seeing and this is a jump this is a stretch um because i have to you know be a little more specific in, in looking for certain types of artifacts but you start finding these longer needles these very long type of needles and then these other type of wood type working tools and, and wood shaping type tools you're looking at like a primitive boat making operation essentially and these long long points needles i think a lot of them were probably made out of bone or antler and we don't have a lot of them left but some of the stone one some of these pieces we do have left and these giant long needles are probably for sewing hide boats together and a lot of the, the most advanced ships, the ones that the Neanderthals and the Denisovans, which the Denisovan genotype, as far as the DNA um, is concerned, is, is from Australia, the oldest living people of Australia. Um, and the Aborigines DNA shows up in the most ancient people in South America, the Denisovans, and the most ancient blood group of this other species of people that we don't know much about because we only found a few trace fossils uh, and a couple artifacts, one including this jadeite torque, which is a type of bracelet with a perfect fixed high-speed drill hole through it. You know, this artifact is early as 60,000 years old, made by the hands of a relative of, of, of human, probably more resemblance to Neanderthal than, than to modern human. Although we're all related species because we can cross, you know, we can cross breed, we can mate with one another. So that means we're technically, we're the, you know, we're not that different. Um, these people were just as smart, probably bigger, more wholesome than us. Um, but uh, they definitely had some form of language. They definitely had... Uh, burial customs they definitely had art um, and they were all sense of had the same mind and brain capacities as modern human um, and I think when I say North America Neanderthal when I bring up these buzzwords that generate a lot of hype um, this is what I'm saying I'm saying that there was definitely a group of people making tools that were non-composite like the tools they find in Africa that were made by primitives cousins distant relatives hominids that weren't quite human yet um Arthropithecus, i think was the name and uh, the other one i don't know all the different names of all the hominid species over time but they're making these very basic non-composite tools meaning no shaft no handle just the stone tool was the tool 
and you get a lot of these half trapezoid shapes. You usually get this chert material, this, this hard type quartzite, like fossilized coral, really. Um, and you get a lot of these like these simple tools, simple cutting tools. Um, like here's a very simple cutting tool. You've got an edge on each side. But um, so there's a simple cutting tool. You have an edge on each side. It's not going to be attached to anything. This could have just been shaped this way by polishing and flattening it out. Um, but these are, are much more primitive. They're older and they're ancient and they're down <laughs> right in that first layer before bedrock. Um, and then after that, um, before the 13,000 year stuff, before the Clovis stuff, we get all this Salutrian type stuff. We get some um, different uh, high advanced flaking like this willow leaf point down there. Um, we get these little like stemmed points, um, these Dalton shaped points over here, bifacially flaked on both sides. And then as you get later, you get, um, as you get into the Paleo Indian, um, out of the Paleo in, in, uh, Indian into the woodland time frame, um, talking like a thousand, uh, you know, BC to like a thousand AD into that new woodland period and neo woodland period, you start um, seeing conflict, a lot of conflict as different Native American groups run in and, and, and vouch for resources such as beaver, uh, the good stone, uh, silver, uh, iron deposits, um, good hunting ground, all uh, resources. You start seeing a lot of conflict. And here's a really old um, stone tool. Now we can see some staining in it, but I, I pulled this one out of out of my box. So I have tons of different bigger stone tools just to see that this is not a rock. So we start with this flat side and somebody has literally struck grooves on the front here and flattened that front side. The back side is now percussioned out with a big percussion whack to get this whole, this whole concave cutting area here. And then this area, if you could see closely here, this is this pressure flake to make it sharper even yet. Uh, so you have an implement that's sort of doing this kind of thing or for sawing and for cutting. And this is probably, because it's not straight here, this was probably shoved into a shaft and you've got something where the blade sticks out the side and you got a reaper, maybe for cutting down crops, clearing out vegetation, um, more of an agricultural type thing that could be quickly turned into a weapon of war of in conflict. Um, but then we see a lot of like the Susquehannock type Celts, which are extremely triangular. We see a lot of war Celts in that area, which I don't have that tray out right now. I'll have to go through that. And then at these sites where these deep holes are, where these crossing points where this ritualization, this practice is going, these beautiful things are, are, are left like these animal effigies that are like made out of beautiful, like Jersey quartzes and, um, like crazy tools that are that are made like ornately left like made out of this crazy serpentine and then the end of another tool that was made out of this crazy you know striped or bandit stone or petrified wood of some sort you start getting effugees like i told you they worship the snapping turtle a lot in the penny pack and the turtle clan was down there here is a side profile of a snapping turtle this is a quartz shaft straightener really for straightening shafts um, for arrows and for spears, but they made it in the head of a snapping turtle. That's really neat because this one stands, like it stands perfect and it's, it's, it's counterweighted to stand up like this. So, and these guys, you can watch these guys in the firelight. You can, you can watch the fire go over them and you can see the eyes and the mouth and you can see movement. And you can see that it's done with a lot of intent. Um, and you get these animal profiles and that's going into this like Neolithic time frame coming out of the hunter gathering time frame into this planning time frame. And then you see these vast, uh, vast systems of organization as far as these quarry sites that come from a much older people that for lack of better term, I call the Salutrin. They may not even come over from there, but it was a time, it was a group, a large time period prior to 13,000 there's people on this continent 
going back 100,000 years. And if we just dug a little deeper, we could find it everywhere. This is in one creek. I mean, and uh, anyone that scoffs at any of the collections says they're just rocks, they're not stone tools. I think you need to go back to school a little bit. That, that, that's fine with me. I don't really, really care. Um, it's plain to see, though, in, in most of the artifacts um, that nature doesn't, doesn't shape things with such intent and doesn't leave fingerprints and handprints and things, especially the soapstone. The soapstone artifacts are very, very cool because you can really see like people's fingerprints and handprints because when the stuff gets wet, it gets so soft, but you can see this cutting edge. Um, and you get into the more Salutrian style knives, these side pieces, and you get these, um, this is clearly really high grade um, flint and some quartz, but you get the same Salutrian knife shape which is typical to like what our modern knives kind of look like. Um, but yeah, this is um, most definitely fascinating stuff. And um, it's most definitely not just rocks. A lot of it is rocks, but a lot of it is shaped rocks, AKA meaning stone tools. Um, some of the collection is not rock. Some of it is metal. Some of it is bone. Some of it is glass. Some of it is pottery. Um, some of it is ore. Um, but like when you see a tool like this, that is, that is hardened, um, that is notched perfectly, um, that has the notching on the top still, you can see the staining from whatever paint or enamel was on it. And you see this perfect hammerhead. You see beaches of these things because they were crushing up ores and rocks like this to extract and make metals out of them. Um, at a time when we didn't think they were doing that stuff, but they were, um, and there's definitely this influence later on that utilized all of this stuff into a much bigger practice. And I think that's what's related to the mound building cultures, Cahota, and to the civilization that was in America. And, and what you may find out is that civilization might have not got here last. It may have spawned from here and branched out. Maybe America was that Atlantis. Maybe it was the lost colony or the lost landmass that sunk in a day when that big comet hit 13,000 years and, and put America under a thousand, you know, a thousand feet of water. Um, so the Grand Canyon wasn't formed over a million years. It was formed overnight when billions of gallons, tons of water were pushed through from massive floods and it left these glacier eradicates all over the place, giant boulders that could got washed in on the melting ice sheets when that comet hit. And um, obviously the science plays that out. I mean, we can look at all of the most advanced science in, in, in this stuff and, and, and uh, see that, oh yeah, 13,000 years ago, something bad happened. 10,500 BCE, um, something terrible happened. Um, you know, all the megafauna got wiped. Everything was gone. Every, this mass event happened. And um, I think what we know, everything we know about history, everything we picked up since then, we have this crazy mental block because we're just a surviving group that lived on from this crazy catastrophe. And we don't really remember our distant, distant past. Humans have been around, the modern humans have been around, I guess the oldest known fossil, 250,000 years old, roughly, the oldest modern, what you would say modern human. We've had a lot of time. We've had a lot of time. You know, it only took us a couple hundred years to figure out how to get to space. So we had all those thousands of years. We could have had great civilization built. We could have traveled through space. We could have had time machines. We could have had major cities. We could have had submarines. We could have had airplanes. We could have had boats. And if the cataclysm like a comet happened and so devastatingly wiped out everything, you would have no history, very little bit to put back together. But it starts in America because the American archaeology has this terrible paradigm and it's just done terrible shit work in the field of archaeology. It's done more work suppressing the things they found than actually explaining them or trying to attempt to explain them. And I'm not talking about deep black hole conspiracies here. I'm just talking about how come on every other continent there's been a subspecies human that's 100,000 years, but we have a continent that just has the same, at the same time period, had the same climate, had the same resources, if not more. Why wasn't those species on, on this? This continent was just left alone and everything had to come here? No. 
there's a forbidden archaeology that's been covered up, but those old heads are starting to die off. The people that are protecting that knowledge are dying off. So it's time to really take American archaeology past that 13,000 year mark and figure out what the hell is going on because it might apply outwardly to the rest of the world. What if everything came from America outwards and not the other way around? Maybe that's the missing piece. Yeah, that, that's a huge thing. I'm putting out a, lo a lot of, if, you know, a lot of ludicrousy there maybe for some. But if Epicenter was Greenland and Canada for those comet strikes, the things closest to it would be wiped out the most totally. And I really, really think the same thing you see in the mound cities, this exploration into the sky past the Milky Way, this, this journey... These pyramids, this this alignment of their monuments um, with celestial uh, markers in the sky um, that correlate with the Egyptians' afterlife philosophy and their their thought practices, the Ohio Valley thought practices, the Mayan thought practices. All these cultures had this underlying same spiritual belief in the sky and the journey and afterlife, and they all seem to be building pyramids on different sides, different places of the earth. There's some ancient underlying advanced culture that we just lost. I'm trying to find it. And this stuff, I'm not even talking about advanced cultures here. I'm talking about 150,000 years ago, there was people in America that were producing stone tools that are very similar to those found that people were making 150,000 years ago in Africa. And so on right up the, the queue. The, the queue. So you got to explain to me what half of the stuff is I'm finding that's older than 13,000 years that's been shaped and worked by human hands. Half the stuff here has been picked up by a second group of builders and stone workers after it was discarded hundreds of years prior, thousands of years prior, and reworked into something different because half the work was already done at these quarry sites. And my pottery knowledge is not great, but when I find it, I'm excited. This is probably the oldest piece non-slipware Susquehannock stone pottery and this is you can get somewhat of the profile because this is the rim the rim of a of a vessel of some sort um, so yes these scraps and bits of evidence and this is just mainly one creek there's stuff from three creeks here, but 98% of it's all from, it's from the penny pack. The other like two to 3% is from a couple little exploratory trips along the Wissahickon end. Then the Chamonix is where I have the least amount of stuff from. Just that tray over there, really. Um, but yeah, uh, again, um, I hear tons of, of skeptics and uh, I value everyone's opinion. If you think they're just rocks, that's fine. Um, I know a lot of them are are 